about the word literally for a minute. <laughs> when I tell you that I am literally freezing, uh, you know that I'm cold. But am I actually literally experiencing some sort of drop in core temperature that we need to be very concerned about? Maybe not. And despite my own feelings about the interchangeability, interchangeability of the words literally and figuratively, and I have some opinions. Um, the reality is that we didn't just suddenly all agree to switch the meaning of a word out of nowhere. Different communities use different words in different ways. Language grows and changes and covers new concepts constantly like how the word computer used to describe a person making calculations, but it now uh, describes a whole bunch of different kinds of devices. These changes are routine through conversations, translations, academic use, slang, memes, and literally every other communication we have with each other. There's a reason that the English language has a reputation for like rifling through the pockets of other languages looking for loose nouns. It's because English does that all the time and it's not the only language either. So trying to stop the growth of language is like shouting into the wind. Even if it makes you feel better, it's not necessarily effective. And honestly, most attempts to control language come with a lot of elitist and biased crap the history of the word ink, for instance, is basically a primer on classism and language. We make plenty of tools to help us write and communicate, from linters to dictionaries to everything. We create tools to make sure that we get job titles and other details like that correct. But these tools can also be tools of oppression. Uh, they can, when a uh, journalist relies on a reference that uses outdated or oppressive or outright offensive language, they still see that as a standard. They're not going to go looking for another style guide necessarily because it's easiest to use the style guide that you have. Just like if your paper says that it is okay to dead name someone, you're going to do it if you're a journalist because you don't necessarily have the time, the support, the resources to research and respect somebody's identity. Uh, a, a journalist audience will do the same thing because an authority just did that, just used those terms, just used that approach. There's a ripple effect <clears throat> when we rely on tools created without considering their use or their impact. And we can see this in actual examples from actual tools. There's a particularly awful example that the AP style book updated last year. It used to be that the AP style book uh, would consider the terms child prostitute or teenage prostitute appropriate to use when discussing a person. Um, even though those terms imply uh, that there is an element of consent, that there isn't necessarily an element of coercion. In 2016, uh, one of their editors decided that they were going to remove that as an okay description because the word prostitute implies a sex worker who is voluntarily trading sex for money and someone under the age of consent, by de definition, cannot voluntary, voluntarily participate in sex in the first place. Which is a quote from Tom Kent, one of the editors of the AP Style Book. The AP Style Book will be sure to have more updates in the future. Uh, from new technology terms to hopefully, you know, something that we don't feel awful talking about. Um, that's, in fact, their entire business model. Uh, journalists are often encouraged to buy a new copy of the AP style book every year because there's a new edition every year. Most of us only update like once every couple of years because style guides are a very expensive hobby. But we're used to thinking of style guides as something that will grow and change with the language it's trying to describe. That assumption of change is really useful, at least when we're talking about how to improve, improve the tools and the systems that we rely on. It provides a framework for way, ways to update our expectations as, our, as we learn, ways to improve our communications, and to continue a process of thinking about these things. 
And it's not, it's not a fast process. One of the other changes the AP Press made in 2016 was that they decided that we're all right and internet should be capitalized. <laughs> that one took a long time too. I have some feelings about that as well. But as it happens, there's uh, nothing to stop each of you from opening up a text doc and starting your own style guide. And uh, I've been doing that for years, which basically led me to this specific talk. Writing about people is hard. Um, I've messed up more than once. I've learned a lot of what I know about how to write at the expense of others because I didn't have the training or the knowledge or the tools to write about them in a respectful and responsible way. I started keeping a pre-publication list of everything I needed to double check on my own projects because I misgendered an interview subject. I made an assumption, I hit publish, and a few hours later, I got this incredibly kind email that pointed out my error. I, of course, apologized, but I, that wasn't enough. I wanted to make sure that there was no way for me to make that error again. Uh, a way to make sure that I didn't harm somebody like that again. Um, and the model that, that that's kind of come to mean for me is that I try to do good work, but I'm sure that I will make mistakes in the future. When I do, I will apologize and try to find a way to do it better, which is what Karanda has been telling all of us to do. So I have to give credit there. Um, but for me, <clears throat> that process became creating the responsible style guide, uh, the responsible communication style guide. Don't pick project names that are like four words long or you will regret it. <sighs> Basically, I wanted all of my tools and my tricks and my techniques in one reference manual. Like this was the book I needed to level up in my writing. And then I realized, oh, if I need this, maybe some other writers need it. I could do some research, I've got this list of questions that I still need to, to research, but you know, this could be a useful thing. And then, and this is the important part, this is where I'm pretty sure I prevented myself from massively screwing up. I realized that writing this style guide on my own would be a colossal mistake. Just like the top-down approach that organizations like the Associated Press use, writing everything myself was a way to guarantee that I would get something wrong. If we want to guarantee instead that our work is inclusive, thoughtful, and responsible, we have to create it in ways that are also inclusive, thoughtful, and responsible. And at a bare minimum, inclusion is not work that one person can do. It's kind of by definition, if it's done by one person, it is not inclusive. Um, so sure, I had some tips and some tricks and some questions, but I didn't necessarily have useful answers. Um, but I felt really uncomfortable, and I think rightly so, with asking anybody to work on fixing my writing for free. So I worked with the recompiler, we did a Kickstarter, we raised money, like hours before our campaign was scheduled to end, and we put together enough money to pay our contributors, cover our printing costs. That's basically it. Style guides are not a way to get rich, in case you were wondering. Uh, but we did pay our contributors. And that's one of the pieces of this project that I am just the happiest with. One of the most wonderful feelings in the world is to go up to somebody and say, hey, you're awesome, I love you, I love your work, I have some questions, but can I give you money and then you'll tell me how to not be bad at this thing? And it's just this great feeling to be able to like give people money, oddly enough. <clears throat> and I uh, definitely recommend it if you are in need of some sort of pick-me-up. And you may need the pick-me-up later because this is the bit where we get into all of my feelings. Usually I have to talk about my work in a way that will convince everybody in the room to keep paying me to do that work. Um, in this room, though, I see a lot of people who have already financially contributed to my work. I see a lot of people who have already contributed time and effort into helping me bring this thing into reality. 
So I feel like I have a little bit of freedom to get away from that whole, no really, I'm an expert, pay me for things bit. So I want to say a couple of quick things in conclusion. First off, I don't think that I am the right person to have edited the Responsible Communication Style Guide. And that's not necessarily saying anything about me, but I'm just a person who had willingness and time to work on this project. Focusing on this work, running a Kickstarter, not relying on this book as, a source of, as my main source of income is incredibly privileged. I've tried to stay aware of that privilege throughout, uh, bringing people in who have different perspectives than I do, and making this project as inclusive as possible. But it's not a solved problem. Just like everything else in this world, um, it's not a solved problem. You can't necessarily just throw money at a problem and hope that that fixes it, in part because sometimes you can't throw enough money at it. We had several potential contributors for the style guide who I would have loved to work with, but we couldn't offer them enough money that they could make this project a priority above other paid work that they needed to do. I also want to acknowledge that I don't consider the style guide to be a finished, complete project. I have lists of improvements that I want to make in upcoming editions, topics we still need to cover, experts I still really want to pay. The first edition is just that. It's a first iteration to at least give us a starting point to have more conversations and build more resources on top of and continuing to grow. Given that we live under uh, capitalism, the standard solution to both of my concerns is more money. If I had more money to pay more people, we would have an even bigger team working on the style guide. Um, but I'm not optimistic about either capitalism or getting more money for important work right now. Several communities that I really love are uh, shutting down right now or scaling back because there's not a lot of cash to be had. Even this conference is bittersweet because there's only one more altar comp after this. For the organizations that have the most money to give to things like diversity and inclusion, it's not, they're not showing that it's a priority. They may say it is, but they're not moving money towards it. When an inclusivity project can't raise $10,000 from a company that spends more than that annually on unisex shirts. There's a problem with how companies are choosing to financially prioritize. And yes, there are always organizations that are looking to buy diversity and inclusivity indulgences, but they don't put money into this long term. You're in this room, you probably already know all of this, but I do want to ask you to do a specific thing when you go back to work next week. I want you to go to your employer, if you have one, and I want you to ask them to spend some money. Not from some poorly funded d &I initiative, but from every other budget. And I want you to do the same thing next week and the week after that. Look at technical training budgets, continuing education credits, the holiday party planning team. Look for ways to move the money that they have into the hands of people doing good work. Helping plan a party, Pick a catering company that's owned by a person of color. Need C CE credits for a professional certification? Check if there's CE credits specifically on accessibility in your credentials. Got a technical training budget? Choose the trainers who subsidize their community work with their paid trainings. I'm not asking you to seize the means of production here, but I am asking you to uh, redirect those means every chance that you get. I know that's not a particularly inspiring message, but it's the one that I have for you today. Um, and on that cheerful note, the last thing I want to do while I'm up here is to acknowledge all of the amazing people who have worked on the style guide and helped bring it to reality. And I can't name all of you in the time that I have left, but I wanted to specifically thank Audrey Eschreit, who is our publisher, um, our contributing editors, uh, Stephanie Murillo, Ellen Dash, Heidi Waterhouse, Melissa Chavez, and Anant Moskowitz, and our designer, Mel Rainsberger. I did a lot of the cat herding on this project,
but there literally would not be a book without these people. And I mean the real 